everyone hope you are all well so uh today's topic this evening's topic um is this notion of the stiff upper lip and it's something that's very associated with britishness um but actually there are some similar concepts in other countries and just we'll briefly um look at them i've literally just looked at this on wikipedia uh sisu is a term from finland um meaning persistence i believe in the finnish language um, gamam, gambaru are terms associated with Japanese culture again to do with endurance um, this idea of the stiff upper lip is supposed to come from the idea that the upper lip when we're frightened quivers um, that seems to be particularly associated with Britishness a lot like I mentioned there are international equivalents uh, but just going to read out a little bit of the Wikipedia article this of course dates back to uh, the Victorians um, were heavily influenced by the classics and the term gets back to the idea of the Stoics of ancient Greece um, and even beyond that so I'm just going to read out the origins paragraph on Wikipedia the idea of the stiff upper lip is traced in ancient Greece to the Spartans whose cult of discipline and self-sacrifice was a source of inspiration to the English public school system and to the Stoics Stoic ideas were adopted by the Romans, particularly the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who wrote, If you are distressed by any external thing, it is not this thing which disturbed you, but your own judgment about it, and it is in your power to wipe out that judgment now. The concept reached England in the 1590s. So, ah, I'm wrong about that. It even long predates the Victorians. I'm featured in the plays of William Shakespeare. His tragic hero Hamlet says there is nothing either good or bad, uh, but thinking makes it so. Poems that feature a memorable evocation of Victorian stoicism and a stiff upper lip include Richard Kipling's F and W. E. Henley's Invictus. Um, the phrase became symbolic of the British people. I believe, actually, just going back there, I think the Invictus poem was famously um, inspired Nelson Mandela when he was in prison. And of course, uh, Prince Harry later used it in his, in his innovation of the Invictus games. Uh, the phrase became symbolic of the British people, and particularly of those who were students of the English public school system during the Victorian era. Such schools were heavily influenced by Stoicism and aimed to instill a code of discipline and devotion to duty in their pupils through character building, competitive sports, as immortalised in the poem by Tai Lampada, corporal punishments and cold jars. And of course, that system is pretty notorious now. If you know The Crown, there's an episode showing uh, Gordonston, the public school up in Scotland, where uh, Prince Philip and the other Prince Charles went to, and the King, uh, then Prince of Wales, Archie then just Prince Charles, described it as uh, cold it's and kilt. It was notoriously brutal, um, serious bullying and, you know, tough physical conditions. Um, there's some examples of this, uh, of this stoicism, uh, that can be found in British culture. So Francis Drake, finishing a game of balls before embarking on the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Some of these may be apocryptical, if I'm pronouncing that right. During the Battle of Waterloo, the Earl of Sussex's, excuse me, the Earl of Uxbridge's calm assessment of his injuries, he lost a leg to the Duke of Wellington after being hit by a cannonball. Um, during the sinking of the HMS Birkenhead in 1852, Soldiers famously stood in ranks on board, allowing the women and children to board the boat safely and escape the sinking. And that may be the origins of the concept of women and children first, particularly in a maritime context, uh, because actually there's no written law of the sea that actually states that. Um, if there is anything, I would imagine it's vulnerable people first, but it, it's thought to date from that tragedy. In 1912, during the Terra Nova expedition, Captain Lawrence Oates, aware that his own ill health was compromising his three companions' chances of survival, calmly leaving the tent and choosing certain death, saying, I'm just going outside and maybe sometime. Uh, also in 1912, of course, Captain Edward Smith directing the evacuation of the Titanic before going down with the ship. Uh, Major Allison Digby tapped on water who would wear a bowler hat and carry an umbrella into battle in the Second World War, most famous at the Battle for Arnhem Bridge. Um, and actually, going back to the Titanic, there's numerous examples of that. Um, Benjamin Guggenheim and his uh, valet famously showing the stiff upper lip as the ship was going down. In 1982, Captain Moody aboard 
um, British Airways Flight 9 from London to Auckland, and realising that all engines of the aircraft had stopped because of volcanic ash, and answer the passengers, we have a small problem, all four engines have stopped, we are doing our damnness to get them going again, I trust you are not too much in distress. So it was up front with the passengers. In 1989, United Airlines Flight 232 suffered a catastrophic engine failure that rendered all hydronics, hydraulics inoperable, resulting in the aircraft being virtually uncontrollable with the exception of the engine throttles. Captain Al Haynes kept a healthy sense of self-deprecating humour throughout the ordeal. Uh, now that's an American airline, so this isn't unique to the British uh, which could clearly be heard in the cockpit voice recorder. The crew, along with the passengers who were off-duty pilots and flight engineers, managed to crash land the aircraft at Sioux Gateway Airport in Iowa. In simulation scenarios, no crew has ever been able to make it to the airport, and the event is often cited as one of the best examples of crew resource management in an emergency situation. If you ever see that programme, um, Seconds from Disaster, uh, they often depict the sort of uh, air aviation, particularly survival situations, and sometimes it's great, uh, you know, teamwork by the captain or, excuse me, the pilot and co-pilot. Other times, not so much. Um, but you know, this can be seen for history. Uh, I think of the First World War. I think of this idea of, um, particularly after that Gilded Age. You know, we were at the peak of empire. We were the most powerful. Uh, country on earth at that time and there was a very very strong sense of patriotism and, and nationalism of course in that great surge of 1914 um, and not just in Britain across across Europe but that got into this notion of uh, what it meant to be a man and I think it actually tapped into very very old concepts probably even going back to medieval chivalry one of the recruiting tools of course of the first world war was uh, the propaganda about what Germany had done in Belgium. Now, the interesting thing about that, um, in the mid-20th century, that was thought to be exaggerated, it was thought to be allied propaganda to vilify Germany. Actually, there probably were some atrocities. So the rape of Belgium may not have been so exaggerated after all. Uh, there were atrocities against civilians. But the posters of the time very much played on this concept of you know a small catholic country um belgian women being raped and that very much pitched to irishmen you know as another small catholic country you know will you stand by and let this happen uh, and the very i mean there's no getting around it the damsel in distress notion was very much used in the recruiting drive of world war one um which is something that, you know, feminists sometimes overlook with all of this because throughout history there are examples of men dying to protect women, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, you know, yes, it's true that men start most wars, but it's also true that men die in most wars, and more often than not it has been to defend women. Um, I'm not saying that's universal. There's also been atrocities against civilians, and we've seen this throughout history as well, but... Um, you know, I think the invasion of Ukraine last year is a glaring example when Ukrainian men were expected to stay back and, and fight and defend their country. No male privilege there. Um, that's not to, you know, uh, disrespect the bravery of all Ukrainians, Ukrainian women as well. Um, you know, many of them have also died in service of the country. Um, but it was something that was uniquely placed on them in the sense of fighting for their country. Um, but the, the notion of stiff upper lip, I think it's the idea of stoicism. If we can look at stoicism, it's I think it's a good thing, broadly speaking, because the world is challenging, life is challenging. And I think if you're too sentimental and too sensitive, you know, it, it's not a way to survive in this world. Um on the other hand, we have learned a lot more about mental health, and I think it's a good thing that there are now less taboos about, for example, um, manning up and all that sort of thing. Um, it's right that men particularly feel more empowered to talk about their mental health, and you know, there's public figures, um, the Prince and Princess of Wales, even Tyson Fury and others who have kind of destigmatized this on some level. I mean, it's not any one individual. 
I would even say Princess Diana had done her part. Um, but it's not any one individual. It's numerous ind individuals have helped to break down the stigma. And that's a very good thing. Um, because it, to me, it's about balance. Like so much in life, it's about balance. You don't want to be so sensitive and so um, sentimental that everything becomes fragile. Um, and you treat every challenge in life with an overreaction. But I also think that the old Victorian idea of the stiff upper, that it is, it is right that we discard that mentality somewhat because what does it do? Um, it may show temporary bravery, but in the long term, you know, if you bottle things up, which is what Victorians pretty much expected, that's that's not healthy. It's um, it just builds up inside, and it's uh, no doubt in the past suicides came about from that, particularly from men um, on everyone, but particularly men um, of having to hold a stiff upper lip. Now, I think it's a good thing that we're more compassionate today, that we're more open about emotions. But I do think it's just a cultural aspect. I think Western people in general, not just Britain, I think Western people in general particularly in Northern Europe. I think this is something we have somewhat similar to, say, the Dutch, the Germans, the Nordic countries, as opposed to Southern Europe. Um, we're just not that emotive. You know, even in light of a disaster, I, I mean, I think of the big railway disasters of the 1950s at Cairo. Uh, that was a major disaster. You know, there would have been the initial, the, there would have been ambulances and fire service and emergency services. Um, maybe uh, local people, um, well, not maybe they did help out, you know, they, they gave people blankets and tea and so on. Um, but back then, there wasn't really the same sense of post traumatic care that we would have today. Um, so things have changed. Um, and I would say for the better, for the most part. Um, the flip side of this is people can be too sensitive today, particularly on issues around race and. Um, other potentially taboo issues, I do think we can be too sensitive. So I'll just conclude this video by saying my attitude to the, the British idea of the stiff upper lip is tapping into the classical idea of stoicism. It's not an entirely bad thing. And some of it definitely we could do if, I mean, uh, we think of the spirit of the Blitz and the spirit of Dunkirk. There was even echoes of this during the pandemic. It was sort of like, great challenge of this generation um, and I think most British people actually, I don't really share this view that we're a generation of snowflakes I think that's a bit of a frankly right wing exaggeration and I don't believe that all millennials are snowflakes either um, I've said this before, you know, a millennial is simply roughly corresponding to the generation born between 1982 and 1998 I'm I'm on the older side of millennials, but I'm proud to be a millennial. Um, now that's a that's a huge number of people, and to just you know sometimes I hear older people just dismissing it as they're a bunch of snowflakes. Um, it is true that woke mentality is often associated with its generation, but frankly, some of those who promote the ideas of, uh, that we can find in woke ideology, like identity politics come from baby boomers, come from baby boomer academics, particularly in the United States. So I'm not a fan of sort of pigeonholing one generation in one way or another. I, I think that's misleading and all it does is create tensions between older and younger people unnecessarily. So, um, And I, I don't really like the term snowflakes in general because I think the issues around mental health and bullying and... Um, those sort of things, they should be taken seriously. They're not trivial matters. Having said that, where there are accusations, there's always two sides to, side to every story. Like, for instance, the recent Dominic Grab bullying allegations, it's a question of how far did he go? So was he constantly yelling at civil servants, Gordon Ramsay style? Or was he simply trying to deliver for his department? And therefore that meant high demands and there were civil servants who were a little bit too precious and, um, you know, basically not used to a minister standing up to them and saying, this is what I expect. We'll never really know. 
people never really know it. Basically, Bob strenuously denied it. Um, they assert the allegations, but none of the, um, a lot of, I shouldn't say none, but not a lot of the claims didn't hold up. So who knows? Who knows? But basically, I'm middle ground with this. I think that stoicism is a very good thing, but I don't believe, you know, pressuring someone to show a stiff upper lip in light of tragedy, in light of a traumatic personal event. I think, you know, in this day and age, they should be allowed to really go through that process and you can't expect someone to get over it in a day or a week or a month. Um, for their own sake, it, it, you know, they need to be helped on that process. But telling someone to get over something is not... Um, it's not a very compassionate way to approach these things. Um, you know, anyone who's been through clinical depression or any sort of traumatic life event should have some sympathy. The flip side, of course, is not to be too sensitive. And, you know, hypersensitivity is a very unattractive quality because it means that other people are walking on eggshells. It means that you're interpreting things too much. But this comes down to balance. So... I'm supportive of the stiff upper lip concept to an extent, to an extent, but not in so far as, for instance, it it imposes rigid gender roles or um, sort of expects people not to to be honest to themselves. I mean, me for instance, I'm a very candid person. If someone says, "Hi, are you Nathan?" and I'm not feeling good, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I'm not going to tell. I'm great. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's just not in my nature. I tend to be someone who's quite honest about my emotions. But anyway, there you have it. Let me know your thoughts. What do you think of the stiff up a bit? Do you think it carries some merit? Do you think it could be a bit too rigid in this day and age? What, what's your thoughts on it? Um, let me know.